I rode in the ambulance from to do the transfer from the Royal Alex to the Stollery, and they told us that the COVID protocols would be the same when we got there. So when we were at the Royal Alex, we once I was discharged and no longer a patient, we couldn't go in together at the same time. So we would have to switch off, um, take like shifts essentially, and then when we got to the Stollery, um, only one parent per day was allowed in. So they told us that we were being transferred for Arden to have surgery on his diaphragm. And they told me that because I was already in, that Brody would not be allowed in that day. So we thought that he was gonna get rushed to surgery without Brody having seen him. So that was really scary. And then he ended up not getting surgery until two days later, mm -hmm. but it was still, there was I think like four, four days maybe where we had to just switch on and off. So if one of us saw him one day, um, the, you know, the other would not be able to see him in that same day. We'd have to wait a 24 hours and go in the next day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then he had his surgery, his diaphragm surgery, because his, he was born with his right lung eventrate, uh, right diaphragm eventrated. So essentially, the diaphragm was up way higher than it should have been, so his lung couldn't uh, expand fully. So he had to get that sutured down in a surgery. And then the lung did inflate, but uh, it obviously doesn't function as to full capacity like your lungs should, so. And because it hadn't been inflated to that point, um, the lung tissue becomes very stiff. So when, when it reinflated, it actually got a pneumothorax. So it re-collapsed again. Um, so nothing ended up having to be done um, for that. Uh, the lungs naturally will reinflate and, and kind of heal themselves, but it just takes time and then extra um, pressure support to try and open them up. But it was a, it was a tough balance because too much uh, with the stiff tissue would cause another, another pneumothorax and not enough wouldn't inflate the lungs enough and he wouldn't be getting the oxygen supply that he needed. Yeah, so I mean, when we were in the hospital, it was, it was really touch and go for a long time. Arden was intubated um, until the beginning of July, on and off. They tried extubating him four, four times, three, three times before. The fourth time he was extubated, they, they told us that would be the last time. Um, so essentially he had an endotracheal tube to breathe, um, which has become more common in the media lately because of COVID, a few people mm -hmm. have, have needed that, but um, he, he had uh, that and, and essentially they worked towards doing like pressure support trials and different things like that to try and get him off the, you know, to try and build his strength so that he could have the breathing tube removed and still be able to breathe. And they did try it three times before that. And each time he would do okay for, you know, maybe half a day, a day. Um, the third time they did it, he lasted eight days, mm -hmm. eight days um, before you know, the signs started showing that he was just not doing okay. So like his CO2 levels would rise. Um, um, his bicarb was compensating for, you know, the fact that he was, um, what in would you say? In respiratory, in respiratory distress. Dist distress, essentially. He'd get really, he'd gotten really sweaty. Um, he was, you know, his heart rate was really fast, that kind of thing. And so he had, the last time they re-intubated him, they just began prepping to, to extubate him again, but it was like, this This is gonna be the last time. And if it doesn't work this time, we'll be having a different conversation. And at that time, we didn't know what that different conversation meant. So finally, our the head neonatologist that was working with us sat me down, because, um, and I had Brody over the phone, because he couldn't be there at the time. Um, and just kind of told us what that would mean if he if he couldn't be extubated again. And that's when we started to talk about a tracheostomy. And so, yeah, the, the last the last time he was extubated was when he went to that scuba BiPAP mask. And he was on that for a month uh, before we realized that he just wasn't gonna make, you know, he just wasn't doing well enough to, to make that sustainable. And- We tried fighting the trach for a long time. I think mainly out of fear and just lack of knowledge. Yeah. Um, but after we kind of could see the signs, um, we knew that it was the best option. And, and now that we reflect back on it, 
we're really happy that that we did go down that route because it's he's thrived since we've done it. That that was yes. a big turning point in yeah. in his recovery. Yes. But it took a long time to get to that point. And our hospital stay was like, oh, it's not easy. Bro essentially, well, Brody had already taken time off work for like, well, before before I had Arden and not not uh, by choice, but because of COVID, his clinic had shut down. So that was that was a big deal because he'd already taken time off work there. And then after Arden was born, obviously I wanted him in Edmonton with us for as long as he could be. But then after a while, we you know um, his clinic reopened and we realized that he had obviously had to go back to work. And at that time, um, only one parent. So they'd changed the COVID pr protocols so that. Um, both parents could come in on the same day, but at different times. So, and it could only be parents that visited. And one um, swap a day. Yeah, one swap per day. So essentially Brody worked to start with Monday to Friday, and then he would drive down to Edmonton on Friday night. Um, he would usually spend Saturday morning with Arden, and then we'd have lunch together and swap out, and I would spend till the evening with Arden and then we'd see each other for a little bit and then go to bed. And then he would see Arden for Sunday morning and then we'd have lunch together and he'd have to drive back here. So we didn't really see each other much in that time. It got better at the end of June. They started letting us come into the hospital together to see Arden. That was huge for us because then we actually got to spend our days as a family hanging out with Arden because until that point we had not we had not been together with Arden since he was about... Since you were in the hospital? Since, um, since I was a patient mm -hmm. at the Royal Alex. So he was two days old. Was a lot, and then, and then uh, we had to wait till June to, to be all together again. So that was, that was huge when that changed. But then the driving back and forth was a lot and he wouldn't see you know, much of me or much of Arden. So he ended up starting to take the Fridays off. So that was helpful. Um, so that we could just have a little bit more time. And that's pretty much how we did it until December, is he would drive back and forth every week. Um, on you know Thursday night, he'd drive down, spend Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning with us, and then drive back on Sunday afternoon every week till December. So yeah, until, and then at that time, because, because there was only parents allowed in, I just did the whole week by myself. Um, and that was really hard because there was so much going on with Arden that I had to learn to keep track of all his, you know, all of his medical, all the meds he was on and all the changes that were made being with his vent and, you know, all the x-rays and echocardiograms and ECGs and, um... In a very short period she became a medical mom and a medical professional because she had to learn all the all the medical terms um, I wanted to understand it was, everything it was very that was overwhelming to him it was it was overwhelming but at the same time it was like a I don't know a challenge for me I guess because I, I was like I want to know what's happening with him and I want to know why and I want to know that I'm making the right choices for him when they ask me questions and there were you know there were times when other moms in the NICU would say to me well I don't know what's happening with this and I'm like well take notes ask questions do you want me to ask for you because mm. <laughs> it would freak me out that they didn't know what was happening with their own baby because for me I, I wanted to know everything and it it kind of caused me to become <laughs> a little bit of a control freak <laughs> but 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 it also was it was survival for us I you know knowing what was happening with him and being able to understand all of it helped me to advocate for Arden and just to you know when you know, doctors can have certain ideas about what they, what their goals are, or what they want to do, but there's a lot of different ways to go about it, and and they really, they, you know, at the Stollery, they really were good at taking cues off of us as a family and and working with us to to give us the best care for him. Um, yeah, but it was really like what because you know I would spend, I don't know, I never wanted to be away from him at all. <laughs> So I would, you know, get there at eight in the morning and I wouldn't leave until 10 p.m. at night. And there were a lot of days where I didn't even want to leave to eat because there was just so much going on with him that I didn't want to leave his bedside ever. Um, and he was in distress 
and you know they would say that he was sick and I always hate that I, I always hated that they called him sick because you know I thought he's not sick this is just who he is right now but he was he was ill he was sick because his lungs weren't functioning like they needed to and he was working way too hard to breathe so once he got his trach he had a, a bit of a, a setback with that yeah that was hard the day he got his trach was a was a Thursday and that was when Brody was still so that was August 6th he got his trach um, and Brody was still working on Fridays so he I you know I don't know in retrospect I should have said take the time off work like but but he, we felt like we had to get to work we were like we don't have any money if he doesn't work you know um, so I was like that's fine I'll do it like he you know I'll take Arden into surgery it's not a big deal and it totally was a big deal um, you know, the way that they described most kids getting trachs um, was not the way that our experience went. And I think that that came, that came to be a common denominator with Arden. Anytime they would say, this is how things typically go with kids, he would totally turn left and just, it would, you know, he would surprise us and his recovery or his procedures would go totally different than what they described. And that's exactly what happened with his trach. So I, I ended up, you know, on the day that Arden got his trach, it was early in the morning. I took him into surgery. You know, I got to walk down to the surgical area um, with him. I took him in myself, and I just kind of kept Arden or kept Brody updated over the phone and that kind of thing. And then when he got back, it was like it's just so hard to see your baby in that recovery state of surgery and. He was totally sedated and, you know, he had blood all over his little body and, um, and he just looked awful, like absolutely awful. And, he, and, and then that, you know, they started talking to me about trait care and different stuff because I wanted to know how to do all of his care right away. Like I want somebody to talk to me and teach us and, um, and then, Later that night, um, he started to struggle, um, and he, he, he was doing really well when he first came out with the trach, breathing-wise. He was doing great, you know, he had to be sedated because um, essentially they say when, when after a kid gets a trach, they, they stay sedated for about a week um, to, to promote healing, um, so they're not moving and causing any issues, so that the stoma heals, and then um, they should be able to move after that. But for Arden, um, he started to struggle breathing that night and they couldn't figure out why. So the respiratory therapists, um, you could tell that they were panicked because they lost end title, we call it, where they would um, be tracking his CO2 output and all of a sudden they couldn't get that anymore. Um, it was gone. And he had a, such a huge leak around his trach um, and they kept filling his cuff and unfilling it and filling it back up and they couldn't figure out why that was happening. Um, his sats were plummeting, his uh, volume in his lungs was, was plummeting and they couldn't figure out why. And so, uh, you know, it, the, neo or the intensivists were around, the respiratory therapists were around and they started, you know, they were trying to figure this all out and finally um, they called the ENT who was on uh, on shift that night and they came up to do a bedside bron bronchoscopy to see what was going on and basically there was like 10 people in Arden's room we were in the PICU so we had our own room thank goodness but there was about 10 people in the room and finally the, the, the ENT surgeon just said you need to book this this kid needs to go back to the OR and I just remember him being, they're like, well, when, when do you want to book it? And he was like, now, you need to, right now, get the paperwork happening, get this kid's bed unhooked, like, we're going now. And so I didn't really know what was happening. They just said that um, he needed to go back to surgery it immediately. And it was, it was terrifying because before that happened, he had done that where he turned blue, like he, um, his sat dropped to 50. Um, he turned completely blue and 
So I guess when they told me that he was going back to surgery, I figured they could fix it. Like whatever was wrong, they could, they could make it better maybe. Um, and then, yeah, it only took not very long time in, in surgery, but, but Brody wasn't there, so I was by myself. Um, my mom actually had been let in at that time to be with me during the week when Brody wasn't there, so that was like a lifesaver. But it was hard because when my mom was there that night, I, she didn't know what was happening half the time, and I was having to live it and then explain to her, you know, what was going on. And so when he came out of surgery, the, the, uh, the resident um, intensivist explained to me that he had essentially his trach somehow, when they placed it, got inserted in a false tract. So essentially, instead of going into the correct hole and into the trachea, it had slipped into the subcutaneous tissue of his neck and only the tip was in his trachea. So it was very, very unstable and any time it moved, he wasn't getting any of the pressure or oxygen that he needed. So um, that night was really, really, really hard. I was at the hospital till about 2.30 in the morning from like seven in the morning till 2.30 the next morning. And I just remember calling Brody like, y you, I was just wrecked. And so was he because he knew that all this was going on but he couldn't be there for us. And, and then I ended up, yeah, we were staying at a little apartment a couple blocks away and I just cried all the way back to the apartment. It was, it was awful. It was probably the worst day that I had at the hospital because I didn't know, you know, the trach was the answer and I thought if, if that wasn't gonna work, then he wasn't gonna be okay. Like, um, so the next day, he was still very unstable. Um, they had to keep him very sedated, very still. Anytime he would even flinch, um, they would give him more sedation meds. Um, and essentially they told me because of what happened, he would have to be sedated for way longer than any other kid who'd gotten a trach. Um, the respirology team told me that they had seen hundreds of kids get trachs and this was only, Arden was only the second kid they'd ever seen that happen to. And we were like, of course, of course this would happen to us. Because nothing was ever smooth in our hospital stay. And so, he was sedated for 15 days. Mm -hmm. 15 days until he started waking up. And so that was hard because Brody would come down on the weekend. And actually on that Friday I called Brody because he was, he was struggling again on the day after. And I just said, cancel the rest of your day, drive down right now. <laughs> you're, you're coming to be with us. And uh, I'm not doing any more of this alone. So those 15 days where he was sedated, he, uh Essentially, we couldn't move him. Um, the respiratory therapist had to come and he could only be shifted about 15 degrees left or right. Um, so essentially, well, with that, because he's barely moving, laying in bed, he also developed pressure sores. So that was another thing that we had to overcome with him once the 15 days had passed um, mm -hmm. and we were able to start at least moving him more onto his sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was hard because he was sedated so we missed him because I would spend all day with him and then I'd go back to the apartment and it was like I didn't even see him today. Like, you know, I would sneak and like hold his hand and the nurses told me I wasn't supposed to be touching him. Um, and then Brody would come down on the weekend and spend all weekend with us and then it was like he didn't even see Arden because Arden wasn't awake. Right, so that was really hard. And I would say once he recovered from his, from his trach surgery, things started to take a turn. Um, kind of for the better, I guess. Yeah, for sure. For a while, we had a couple weeks where things were pretty good. Um, he started, you know, um, once he was coming off some of those infusion meds that he had for sedation and that kind of thing, weaning off of some of those, that was, that was good. Um, but that took a long time. He was on a lot of pain meds and a lot of sedation meds for that two-week period. And so 
it takes a very long time to wean those down. So we actually didn't get him like pretty much almost off the sedation meds and the pain, well the sedation meds were off quite soon after that. But the pain meds like hydromorphone, he wasn't able to wean down off of that until just before his G-tube surgery. So then in October when he had his G-tube surgery, then he had to go back on pain meds again. So then it started the cycle all over again. Hmm. But we did have a really good couple weeks after he got his trach and the recovery for that was done. And then he actually had an incident overnight. When was that? It must have been like a month after he got his trach. I would say, yeah, about a month because he wasn't sedated. Yeah, they called us um, and essentially, what would you say, he had gone into respiratory arrest? Is that what they call it? Where the nurse, and they have nurses right outside the, the room, but um, when the nurse walked in and found him, he was not breathing. Um, and his heart rate had dropped to 60. 60 and his saturation was down. His saturation was like, like low 20 50s. or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they, the nurse actually had to give him CPR. Um, to resuscitate him. And so essentially they figured that was caused by a mucus plug, kind of like what happened to me um, a few weeks ago. Um, But it was such a big event and he dropped so much in sats that um, essentially his lungs collapsed a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, So the ventilator that he was put on after he got his trach is the vent that he's on now. And that's like the going home vent. So we were very excited that he was able to go back on that ventilator um, right after he got his trach. And then when this event happened, he had to be put back on the ICU vent to recuperate his lungs. So that was a major setback because we thought, well, now he's back on this ICU vent. He's not tolerating the home vent. How much longer is it going to be before he builds up the strength that he can go back on that other vent again? And it, it ended up being a long time. He didn't get back on the Trilogy ventilator for home until after he got his G-tube surgery in October. Before we got his G-tube, sur- or before he got his G-tube surgery, we had, we had a few good weeks. In the, we were still in the PICU. Um, he was still on his ICU ventilator, but he was, he was happier. Like he, you know, um, his personality started his, to show. Yeah, his personality started to show a little bit. He started to smile at us. Um, he reached for our faces for the first time ever, and we were so excited about that. His range was starting to get a little bit more where he'd actually try to reach towards toys and reach towards us, and, and that was really exciting because we, you know, we hadn't seen that before. Um, and he was just developing a little bit. Like, we were able to bring him down and, and play with him easier. Um, you know, we had like a little mat that they gave us to play on the floor and, and we did have our own room in the PIC, which was, which was really nice. Um, so we could kind of spend those family times on the weekend, which was good. And then, uh, when he was going to get his G-tube, they had to plan a bunch of other stuff too, because, um, lots of kids just get, uh, their G-tube placed, um, and that's it. But for Arden, he has, um, a non-rotation of his bowel. So when he did have his, before he got his G-tube, he was actually fed via an NJ or a, a, a nasal, nasal dejunal tube. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and essentially that goes from your nose all the way down into the second part of your small intestine. And so the reason he, they had him feeding that way instead of into his stomach is because it was so hard for him to breathe. They didn't want him using any of his energy towards digestion. Um, they wanted all his energy focus to be towards breathing and his lungs. So they fed him via NJ so that <laughs> um, so that he didn't have to digest bolus style feeds, which is what you and I would do. Like um, we eat a big meal and then over time we just digest it, right? So with NJ feeds, he had to be fed 24 seven because it was just little bits all the time going into the small intestine because the small intestine doesn't expand like the stomach does. So 
when he got, then those were hard, really hard to put in. So we had to be very careful that he didn't pull those out because when he did, he actually had to get them put back in under fluoroscopy, which is like constant x-ray. Um, it's like an x-ray video almost. Um, so when we were gonna get the G-tube, they had to plan um, a LAD procedure and an appendectomy as well. So they wanted to make enough space. Um, how would you say that? So to start with, because of the rotational issue, his appendix actually wasn't in the same spot where it was uh, towards the left. It regularly yeah. is. Yeah, so it was on the left. Um, so what they had to do, so the fundal placation uh, is basically they take the top of the stomach and wrap it around kind of the sphincter that's up there just to prevent um, any reflux from coming up. Uh, then the lad procedure, uh, there were some bands that were attached where they shouldn't have been in the intestine from the non-rotation. So they had to go in there and basically cut those bands and remove them. Um, and then they remove his appendix. Yeah. So with his G-tube, you know, they kept saying, okay, this is what the typical recovery for a G-tube is. And respirology was saying, yeah, we're not worried about him. He'll be fine. And we're like... Yeah, but he has, it's not just a G-tube. Our, you know, Arden has to get his appendix removed. He has to get these bands of tissue removed. He has to have the fundoplication um, as well as the G-tube put in. So it was, a, it was a big surgery for him. And recovery with that was really, really hard on his breathing because his whole abdomen was just swollen and sore. So with that, he didn't want to breathe fully because anytime his lungs expanded fully, um, it would push on his abdomen and cause extreme pain. So he had to be on a lot of uh, pain medication. So he went back on the hydromorphone again. Um, and unfortunately, you know, with and, and dexmedetomidine and some other, you know, um, meds. And unfortunately, with those types of medications, as soon as you go on them, you're going to withdraw if you go off of them. So he had to, again, start the weaning process to wean off of those meds. And when, they're giving, when they were giving um, them to him right after his G-tube surgery, uh, they were infusion style, so through an IV. And so he eventually had to convert to enteral doses or, or oral doses of those um, and then slowly start to wean off of them. So they wanted to make sure that his, his uh, before we went to the floors, they call it, or you know, the not in the ICU, um, like the the part of the basically the part of the hospital you get to before you get to go home. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted him to be on, or he had to be on the Trilogy ventilator. He had to be weaned off the um, IV meds, um, and he had to be stable enough to handle open suction. So those were kind of the things we had to work towards. But when he got his G-tube surgery, recovery was really hard because it totally impacted his respiratory status. Um, the first few days were really hard because the respiratory therapist would have to come in and, and bag him, I don't know how many times a day, because all of a sudden, if he, like we would move him and he would be in pain, he would hold his breath and all of a sudden his sats would just plummet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> but as soon as that recovery was looking better and better, we knew that, I would say that was probably the first time when I was like, we might get to go home by the end of this year. That's, it, it might actually happen for us, which was so, like my goal, I just, honestly, the thing that kept me going the whole time was if I, I just asked the universe, I'm like, if you could take us home for Christmas, I will survive this. <laughs> if we can get home for Christmas, we will be okay. Like. That was the goal the whole time. And I swear my prayers were answered because we did. We made it home 10 days before Christmas. <laughs> yeah, we mm -hmm. did. <laughs>